Okay, um, I'm just going to talk about some work we've been doing with my group, and I'm a postdoc with Catherine Graham. And this is part of a much larger collaboration we have that's NASA funded to study hummingbirds in general and hummingbird response under climate change throughout the Western Hemisphere. For this study, we're focusing just on North America, and we're working with a whole host of people, including um, other um, academic partners at Woods Hole Research Center, the Hummingbird Monitoring Network, the MoveBank folks, and eBird through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, I just wanted to mention briefly, I like to practice open science, so the code that's associated with my talk is available on GitHub, and the slides are available on Figshare if you wanted to see them later for any reason or have questions. Um, so of course, we've all been talking about migration today, and these animals that undertake these annual long distance movements are really interesting. Um, one of the reasons they're really interesting to us is because it's sometimes really hard to tell how they manage to balance their energy budgets as they're um, balancing this problem of trying to minimize the amount of time it takes to get from point A to point B, but also minimize the amount of energy that they're ex um, expending to do so, so that they can arrive in sufficient condition to survive the winter or to be able to find mates. Optimal breeding, uh, optimal migration theory gives us a few predictions as to how individuals might make decisions on how they're migrating. Um, some of these might include the current um, position that the individual is in in space and time. It could be their physiological condition, the habitat or resource qualities of their current location, how far they have to go to the next suitable spot, or the current weather conditions. And of course, many of us have been talking about this today and the answer is it's probably a combination of these things. But what we'd really like to know in order to make predictions is, are any of these things more important in one season or one year or for a certain species? Um, in able to make better predictions, um, we need to know this with regard to climate change. Um, so this is one of our ultimate goals with this project, and we're not quite there yet. Um, I think for migration, migrational species in particular, climate change poses a very significant problem that these have to solve. Because now not only does a species or a uh, population need to be able to adapt to the changes that are happening in its current location or to be able to shift its range, but it needs to be able to deal with the kinds of changes that are happening across entire regions or landscapes. And as we know, these changes might happen in very different ways and at different rates, depending on where in the continents that species is located in a given season. So in a really general sense, what we would like to know is what are the factors that ultimately drive migration? We'd like to know if the factors that drive migration are different in different seasons. Uh, we might expect that the uh, physiological or behavioral constraints on birds are different when they're headed to the breeding area versus when they're headed back to the wintering grounds. Um, one thing that really interests me is this temporal component of how much do routes vary from year to year. So we also saw some tracks earlier showing the same individuals that have slightly different migration routes um, across different years. If we can get a handle on what that baseline variation is, maybe it can tell us something about how able individuals or populations will be to respond to changes in climate or environment, um, and therefore give us better uh, uh, predictions as to what might happen under climate change or other kinds of anthropogenic changes that are happening. Um, pretty rapidly out on the landscape. Our lab is particularly interested in studying hummingbirds. Um, I think hummingbirds are really fascinating to study not only because they're very tiny and very beautiful, but because they may have some very different constraints than some other bird species. Uh, they operate within these very tight energetic budgets. Uh, they often migrate very long distances, some of the ones here in North America, and they might have very different constraints due to the fact that they rely so tightly on having nectar availability. And so they need to be able to follow these flowering resources. Um, they're difficult to study because although we can tag individuals, we can put these bird bands on them and attempt to do mark recapture studies, it's really difficult to recapture the same hummingbirds over and over. And so this is a figure that a graduate student in our lab, Marissa Lim, put together. Um, using data from the bird banding lab. Some of these data points go back to the 1930s. And you can see that we still only have 197 good data points where 
a bird was banded and it was recaptured again. Um, in, and we can kind of tell where it went. Most of these, it was only recaptured a single time. So the data here is not um, very good to tell us anything that's really robust and really certain using this kind of individual level data. So because the hummingbirds are also so small, we can't put the kinds of satellite tags or radio tags on them that uh, many others are using. Even that 4.4 gram satellite tag is going to be way too big for a hummingbird. It's just not going to work. And so one of our ideas is to harness the power of bird watchers. Bird watchers are a really fantastic group of people and a really fantastic group of citizen scientists um, who are really relentless in collecting their data. They love to collect it. And eBird has really harnessed this um, obsessiveness with tracking what you're seeing and putting it online in a way that scientists can begin to use. So eBird is uh, held at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And they have pretty good coverage for North America. Um, eBird covers um, globally. Anyone can submit checklists. Um, but for North America, there's checklists submitted for almost every region now. So this is data from 2004 to 2013. It's my understanding that eBird has over 150 million individual observations of birds that have been recorded at this point, And they're receiving hundreds of thousands of checklists every month. So we have a really large data set we can pull from. This is an example with the black-chinned hummingbird. We can see that the number of checklists here on the x-axis has been increasing through time and continues to do so. Um, ideally, we wanted to look at migration pathways for the population for 10 years, but we've decided to really focus our results on the data from 2008 to 2013. Um, and this is also in line with some of the other studies that are currently being done at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. That <laughs> In these earlier years, there's a lot of uncertainty in the data, um, and there's not as much sampling. So we're not going to focus on those. Here in North America, we have five latitudinal migrants that, um, that are strong migrants. We've got black chin, rufous, calliope, and broad-tailed hummingbird. All occur primarily in the west. And then ruby-throated hummingbird occurs here in the east. So we wanted to look at all five of these species and this is from a population level perspective. eBird will not give us the ability to track individuals. Um, some of our predictions based on other studies with birds and other studies coming out of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology was that birds would migrate more quickly in the spring than they would in the fall. So again, we're tracking just the population center. Um, and this is probably uh, the prediction is that they would do this because they need to get up to their breeding area to establish territories and find mates. And many of these are very long distance migrants. Um, we predicted that we would also be able to detect a looped migration route um, where that's clockwise in direction. We predicted there would be more variation if we're thinking about the timing. So um, there'd be more variation in when migration ends in the fall versus when it begins in the spring. Um, we predicted that there's more diffuse migration in the fall. And one thing that we're interested to see is if our eastern species has any different patterns than those in the west, um, and if there's a difference in the variation in migration route and timing. And one of the reasons for this could be that in the west there's a lot more habitat heterogeneity um, that may be more strongly impacted by interannual variation in, um, in climate and rainfall patterns. So in order to summarize uh, migration route at a population level, as a very first pass, we wanted to, to get this broad stroke um, path that we think the population is taking. And so um, to get this path, we wanted to evaluate, be able to get a single path that we could look at for multiple years and be able to evaluate how much this path changes across seasons and across years. So for example, um, we took this approach, um, this was also used in another paper published in 2013 um, from a group at the Cornell Lab. And so for each day and each year, we plotted all the points that a species was seen. So these are all the locations that black-chinned hummingbird was seen on one, Julian Day number 100 in 2012. Uh, we then overlaid an equal area um, icosahedron hexagonal map on top of this. 
And so then we count the number of observations of black-chinned hummingbird in each one of those hex cells. And then we take a weighted mean of, uh, weighted by the number of observations per hex and the total observer effort. So this is the number of checklists for containing any species across all of eBird for that day and that year in order to get a centroid of the population, which would be located here where this red dot is. And so you can see on this day, the bird is located in a pretty wide range, but we're gonna take this one point to summarize the center of our population. And then we took all of those points for all the days, and for each year we were able to draw a pathway. Um, so this path is the colored dots that show where the bird, um, the estimated population centroid for that species for each day throughout this year. Um, and so then we can do that. This is for uh, uh, Rufus hummingbird for multiple years. Some of the challenges to taking this kind of approach um, that some of you may have noticed if you're familiar with hummingbirds is a concern about maybe subsetting by flyway. So for example, this Rufus hummingbird, we might expect if we're familiar with the range map of Rufus to see it more strongly north to south. And here we're seeing a strong signal of it moving towards the southeast, um, which would typically be outside of its range or its main flyway. Um, that's something that we're thinking about how to deal with. And um, because there are likely, we're unsure how real this is. Is this the effect of a lot of bird banders and a lot of very eager birders who are recording a small subpopulation or group of vagrant species or vagrant individuals? Or is this a real signal that Rufus hummingbird, for example, is being seen more in the east? Um, so that's something I'm excited to get some feedback on and to think about. Um, we also, this is a very coarse measurement of where the population is occurring, and it is a little difficult to um, summarize diffuse migration into a single point. And so we've been thinking about ways to deal with that, the error in our single point, and the, using the confidence intervals. Um, and we also have to remember that this is only pre presence-only data from using eBird. So we could try to use a complete checklist in order to get pseudo-absences, and that's something that when we go on to adding in the environmental data, we probably will start to do. But for this first descriptive step, it's just presence. So another recent study has come out trying to redefine what the flyways are using current data. And there's strong evidence that for Western species, this 103rd meridian um, may really be a strong divider for Western migration. So in order to account for the impact of these points that occur outside of where we would normally expect them to occur, we also tried creating these maps um, using just the data within a given flyway for the Western species. And you can see that this has a pretty big impact. So this top figure shows for Rufus hummingbird where it occurs if we use all the data with the colored um, migration pathway. And here is what the migration pathway looks like if we just subset it using the data from the Western flyway. Um, this looks a little bit more what we might expect from looking at the range maps. It also more strongly shows this looped migration pathway that separated um, and based on other observations is what we might expect, where they're coming up here along the coast and coming back down near the mountains. So, and we can see that for all of the years that we get that pattern. So some of the, this is stuff I was just working on this weekend. So I don't have all of the results updated here in this talk, but I'm happy to um, talk more in detail about them, um, the preliminary results we have. So for population level migration speed, what we did was we measured um, during the spring migration timing and during the fall season, we measured the distance traveled in kilometers per day between the population level centroids. And we took the top five and the median of that top five to get the maximum speed um, traveled um, in, for each season for each species. Um, what we see here is that most species do migrate faster and quite a bit faster in the spring than they do in the fall. Um, but some of them, the ruby-throated and the black-chinned, is a little, um, little bit faster in the fall um, or maybe not that different. 
to get the timing, um, I guess I should have showed this a little earlier, um, we took the distribution of where latitudinally the species occurred across the Julian days. So the x-axis here is um, January 1st up through December 31st. And we used a generalized additive model to pick out this inflection point here for each year. And this date we categorized as the beginning of spring migration. And this inflection point was the end of fall migration. And then we took the maximum latitude here as our dividing point for the population between this is what we're going to call spring and this is what we're going to call more the fall. Um, we thought about different ways to also subset breeding time separately, um, but we're still working on that, or I'd be happy to hear some suggestions. So for population level migration timing, what we see is what we predicted that um, most of the species well, all of the species have more variance in the estimated date for the end of fall migration than they do for the beginning of spring. And so maybe the cues that are driving spring might be something that is more fixed, and maybe the fall migration, if they're moving more slowly anyway, they could be coming down and um, just taking more time if there's more resources or waiting to take advantage of um, opportune wind or environmental or weather conditions. Um, that's going to be the next step that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, and we also looked at the spatial variation across years. So we used a generalized additive mixed model with years, a random effect, on the migration pathways for each year that we generated. And what we see here is that date is generally a good predictor of geographic location. These, um, it explains most of the variance in latitude and longitude. Um, but what we do notice is that longitude is a, um, explains less of the variance across the years than latitude does. And so what this suggests to me is that the species perhaps are moving north and moving south at more or less a fixed rate across the years, but maybe because of, of conditions, whether that's being blown off course because of the, the weather or taking advantage or, of resources, they're able to adjust east to west across different years um, in their pathway. And so that might be where more of the variation from year to year comes in the population level pathway. Um, so if I break this out and look, do the same analysis but look separately at spring and fall, um, I wanted to see if I would see any um, patterns in this. Um, but we see that some of the species show more variation in their east-west distribution in the spring, and some of them show more in the fall. And so the next step that we're hoping to um, do with this is to really think about the environmental data that we can use to try to understand these, um, these patterns and what they might really mean. Um, I think one thing that working with the eBird data has been, uh, shown me, it's been really exciting, and it's that the citizen science uh, is a really powerful tool. There's just so much data out there, um, and it's really exciting to get to work with, with people who are excited about looking at birds. Um, so I wanted to point out, um, Tina Cormier is another collaborator who is here. She's going to have a poster tomorrow that's going to be going more into depth on the methods that we're using um, to actually annotate our data with using MoveBank. And so we don't have the individual tracks, but we do have um, these population level data. And we're going to use, um, for the mechanistic stuff, we're going to use the actual um, lat and long given for the each obs observation put in eBird. Um, to annotate with the environmental data. Um, and so the idea is that we'll be looking at NDVI and EVI as a proxy for resources, wind for um, potential opportunity, migration opportunity, and uh, radiation as a physiological demand. Because uh, our hypothesis is that hummingbirds should be very sensitive to changes in temperature or things that increase their energetic expenditure along their migration routes. And so we hope to be able to do that to correlate better with what um, factors are really driving migration and ultimately to be able to project into the future if and how we think these species will adapt to climate change or other environmental changes. Um, and this is just a map uh, Tina will also have on her poster um, for how we're starting to map these points onto NDVI for this is a small location. And so I'd be happy to take any questions. There might be a minute um, for that. It's, it's wonderful that I'm very encouraging that uh, you can talk to this and that you can make 
Yeah. I wonder in that uh, uh, whether because they 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 need to, to eat, I guess, uh, food during migration is quite frequently. Mm -hmm. So maybe combining your approach with some some habitat uh, modeling or yeah. uh, that will constrain the, the parts to the habitat that, that, uh, that are suited for the for different species. So yeah. Maybe Yeah, so the question is what exactly are the, how the habitat or the population centroids relate to habitat um, so that we can get better constrained migration routes? Um, I think that's a really great question. Um, that's some of where we're hoping to go with this. We have our, our summary and then we're also hoping to, um, to the next steps when we have this mechanistic step to then take more of a modeling approach to try to refine our pathways. Um, Eber does have a set of STEM models that they have produced and that they uh, will produce for people in various species that take that kind of that sort of approach. They're not j outlining a pathway, but they can map the species um, uh, dens density and probability of occurrence um, throughout. It's a very pretty map. 